Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Music Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am excited to be with you to talk about some news coming out of the world of music this week. It is um, June 3rd. We have entered into June. Um, It's almost officially summer. It's definitely feeling like summer, and especially with, well, I guess spring and allergies, but summer and allergies. It's, I have allergies all the time, but if I sound croaky, it's just the delightful allergies that I have going on right now. So I do apologize for my croaky voice. I'm going to try not to uh, cough my way through the podcast or breathe weirdly, but if you hear me breathing weirdly, it's just allergies. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, news, as I said, from the world of music. We're going to start with a couple of stories from Jay-Z and Beyonce, actually um, separate stories. The first one is about Jay-Z and that he is officially hip hop's first billionaire, according to Forbes. And this is from NBC News. The Brooklyn rapper and mogul, whose real name is Sean Carter, has amassed a fortune worth $1 billion, according to Forbes, making him one of only a handful of entertainers to become a billionaire and the first hip-hop artist to do so. Um, His sprawling business empire includes stakes in liquor, art, real estate, and big-name companies like Uber. He has um, won 22 Grammys which is amazing. He's launched his own brands. He has um, his own clothing label called Roca Wear, which was sold to Iconics for more than $200 million in 20, 2007. Um, sorry, I should have said he launched his own clothing label. Um, so the, uh, the, the relatively short list of entertainment industry billionaires also includes Star Wars creator George Lucas, Oscar award-winning director Steven Spielberg, media mogul Oprah and uh, Oprah Winfrey, excuse me, Oprah Winfrey and retired NBA star Michael Jordan and this was according to a list published last year by Forbes. Forbes said it calculated the artist's net worth by evaluating his positions in private companies, adding up his income and subtracting a quote healthy amount to account for a superstar lifestyle. The magazine added that it ran its numbers by outside by outside experts to make sure its estimates were fair and conservative. So, interesting. Um, Yeah, I guess it's not like they just go knock on someone's door and say, hi, can we have your financial records? We'd like to write about you being a billionaire. (laughs) Jay-Z is 49. They officially became a billion-dollar pair in 2017 with a combined net worth of more than $1.16 billion. Um, Beyonce, who is 37, has an individual net worth of more than $350 million, according to Forbes calculations. The hip-hop star who comes closest to Jay-Z is Diddy, with an estimated net worth of $825 million. Uh, in 2014, it was thought that Dr. Dre would snag that first hip-hop artist billionaire spot when his Beats company was sold to Apple for more than $3 billion, but Forbes estimated his net worth at the time would have been almost $800 million, saying capital gains taxes would eat a big chunk. So, well, congrats to uh, Jay-Z for being that for you know hitting that milestone and being the first hip hop artist to do so moving on to beyonce who is um you know pretty incredible in her own right 
She is, of course, part of the cast for The New Lion King, and she recently posted on Instagram a series of pictures of her Lion King-inspired outfit. If you have not seen these pictures, please go look at them. This outfit is amazing. It's incredible. It's over the top in like a totally fabulous Beyonce sort of way. It's all gold. Uh, it's a, a gold sort of bead encrusted bodysuit and then there's this gold cape that looks sort of like a cape sort of like a train there's some really dramatic shots with her uh lifting the the cape up so it's even more dramatic there is a lion's face on her torso uh, with a mane of feathers 3d feathers that come out from it she's got gold shoes it's really just amazing and she pulls it off like only beyonce can just regally and um you know, she she just she she wears this outfit that could be considered ridiculous, and she pulls it off in this regal, amazing, fabulous way. That I mean, nobody's asking me to be in the Lion King, but <laughs> um, uh, I could not pull that off. Even if I was amazing enough to be in the Lion King, I could not pull that outfit off. I'm just saying that uh, Beyonce has a special skill in pulling things off that normal people wouldn't necessarily be able to do it. As I said, she is in the new um, Lion King, and her voice has finally appeared in a trailer for the Lion King. She is playing Nala, and um, there have been other trailers that uh, for the movie before. It's set to arrive um, in July, on July 19th. But this is the first trailer to feature Beyonce's voice. Who else stars in this film? Let's see. Uh, Donald Glover also stars as Simba. Um, and the, his voice has also not appeared in any trailers yet. Um, who else? John Oliver, Seth Rogen, Eric Andre, Billy Eichner, and James Earl Jones, who Jones, who is reprising his role as Mufasa, which is awesome because how can you hear Mufasa as anybody but James Earl Jones? Uh, oh, oh, the I forgot one thing I forgot to mention about the um, Instagram, um, the Instagram photos that Beyonce posted also included a photo of Blue Ivy in um, African garb, as well as a, a short video of Blue Ivy lip syncing to the Circle of Life, which is adorable. She's doing it very dramatically and as, you know, you should lip sync to Circle of Life. So that is a fabulous photo shoot. It's an adorable picture and a video clip of Blue Ivy. I am intrigued by The Lion King to see this new and we've got so many so many reboots of disney movies coming out i mean aladdin just came out and did very well at the box office over its opening weekend i've heard great things about it i haven't seen it yet now we've got the lion king coming out in july of course we had dumbo earlier in the year very interesting reboots and i'm still not entirely sure what i think of them but that's okay. Nobody asked me again. <laughs> Nobody harassed me anything. I'm cool with that. Switching gears to another couple in music. That is Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani. They recently said, they, they recently commented on how much they do not care about the tabloid reports about them. They've been together for several years now. And in that time, they have the broken up. I don't even know how many times, according to stories that appear. They've broken up. They are getting married. They are secretly married. They are... Um, having twins, they're having another baby, they're having more twins. It's amazing the number of times they have broken up, gotten married, and had twins. But they take it all in stride, as I'm sure you have to when you are part of a celebrity couple that has lots of speculation on you. I mean, it's amazing. Every time I walk through the grocery store, I see more stories about, you know, people having babies, supposedly, that never actually have those babies. <laughs> oh, all those imaginary babies out there. So they they just took it, in, they, they take it in stride. Blake Shelton tends to tweet, uh, you know, things like, haven't you seen the tabloids? We're having twins. And, you know, he, he tends to be a little tongue in cheek about it. Gwen Stefani tends to post statements through her reps, but they are both kind of in that place of say what you want. We're cool. We don't really care. And I don't know 
I, I, I do know that as um, part of a celebrity couple or as a celebrity in general, I would think that you would have to learn to have a sense of humor about stuff like that to protect yourself where you can to take action where needed, but to really just kind of let it roll off of you as much as possible because otherwise it would drive you crazy. Uh, not sure that I could deal with that. I would, I would take everything way too personally and, and obsess about it. So it's, it's good to see when people react in healthy or responsible ways, but also ways that they're able to kind of poke fun at the situation. And Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani seem to be very good at doing that. So good for them. And it's time to take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll have some more music news, some news about iTunes, some news about Broadway. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Music Podcast, and I will be right back. Always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Welcome back to the GSMC Music Podcast. Before the break, we were talking about Jay-Z and Beyonce, about Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani, and all of the news surrounding those couples. Moving on, I said we were talking about iTunes and Broadway. iTunes has made um, a rather surprising, maybe, announcement uh, that they are expected to, well... I guess they haven't made an announcement. I should backtrack. Uh, Apple is expected to close iTunes after 18 years, which is crazy. First of all, that iTunes has been around for 18 years. I can't believe it's been that long already. It feels like not that long. But um, they are expected to announce separate apps for music, TV, and podcast, according to certain reports. So according to a report by Bloomberg, the tech company, Apple will announce that three separate apps for mu music, TV, and podcasts will supersede iTunes as Apple seeks to reposition itself as an entertainment service rather than a hardware company powered by products such as the iPhone. The move is expected to be part of the keynote address by the Apple chief executive, Tim Cook, at the company's Worldwide Developers Conference in San Jose, California, which started today, and will focus on software updates and Apple's new approach to apps. iTunes was launched on January 9th, 2001, so yep, 18 years, and was uh it was then it was Steve Jobs' then revolutionary platform for music storage where users could rip their CDs into digital form. <laughs> that is just a hilarious sentence right there. Um, I haven't thought about ripping a CD in a very long time, but that's just how music has evolved. Um, in 2003, the iTunes store added the ability to buy tracks legally rather than using popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing sites such as Napster. Um, the attraction of Napster was not just that it was free, but more importantly, it gave people a way to connect with pretty much any piece of music, the former Warner Music Vice President Paul Vidich told Rolling Stone in 2013. What Steve was doing with iTunes was to replicate that type of experience, a vast catalog available on a singles basis with a convenient interface. It had to be easier than Napster. Um... So, of course, things evolve. Music, music listening, music streaming, music, all of those good things have evolved. And now iTunes and its use of downloads have, has become a bit old-fashioned. Um, companies, including Spotify, have introduced successful streaming models as music's most radically democratic era began. That is a quote. Um, Spotify was launched in 2008 and offered unlimited ad-free access to its catalog of music for a fee. It's now uh, $9.99 a month for its premium service. 
The company says it has 217 million users worldwide with 100 million paid subscribers to the service. In comparison, Apple Music has approximately 56 million paid subscribers worldwide. Um, so now they are, they are reimagining the way they are going to do things. And it'll be interesting to see what this, um, announcement actually says right now it's a bit of speculation but they are expected to make the announcement soon so um again it'll be interesting to see and i will keep you updated as i hear more about it moving on from itunes as i said we would talk a little bit about broadway and that is that alanis morissette is bringing jagged little pill to broadway which is Interesting. Um, I it, the, I love Jagged Little Pill. That was um, kind of my era when I was in college. Again, dating myself, but that's okay. Um, it, it, so the, this article says that Alanis Morissette didn't want her landmark album Jagged Little Pill to become a bio musical. So when producers approached her eight years ago about bringing the music to the stage, she had some requests. She is quoted as saying, I was flattered and my initial thought was, is it going to have to be my story? Because that's terrifying. Maybe one day I'll have the audacity to share it in another form. Um, the last thing I wanted to do, to be transparent, was any kind of a jukebox musical or anything that felt compartmentalized or separate. Um, so the cast and creative team gathered at Haswell's Green in Midtown Tuesday night to share songs from the show and to talk about the genres of the production, the genesis of the production, excuse me. The musical premiered at American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts last summer and is scheduled to start performances on Broadway in November. Um, ART artistic director and Tony winner Diane Paulus stages the new musical, which has a book by Diablo Cody, a 2008 Oscar winner for her original screenplay, Juno. Paulus says everyone came to the project like a calling, as the album has been formative for so many. It's produced by Glenn Ballard, who co-wrote most of the songs with Morissette. Uh, the 1995 Maverick release topped the charts in 13 countries, spawning a string of hit singles and notching up sales of over 33 million copies. And this is just taking me right back to college. There was a lot of kind of angry feminist anthems and music out in that point. Uh, it definitely shaped my college years. Yeah, having a little bit of nostalgia here. But um, the show takes these songs and weaves them through a timely female-driven story about characters dealing with issues ranging from addiction and gender identity through sexual assault. The songs take on new life on stage, yet retain their inherent drama. You Oughta Know is still an anthemic breakup song, and All I Really Want becomes an opening I Want song for a family struggling to communicate. Um, Paulus is quoted as saying, I have learned more from Alanis and the thoughts she's given me and the books she's sold me. She's told me to read about understanding, which is the key to this musical. She continues, we cannot heal everything that we are hurting about if we are alone. Everything is done in relationship to other people, and that is fundamental to what she's given us. Uh, Cody crafted a story by zeroing in on characters that already existed in the album. She started with the central figure of Mary Jane from Morissette's song of the same name. In the musical, Mary Jane is a mother struggling with addiction and mental health, distancing herself from her marriage and children. Um, Cody explains, that song tells you everything you need to know about that woman, so I was able to build it out from there. I just feel very fortunate to have this incredible, theatrically rich, beautiful source material to work from. It's not a typical jukebox musical situation where you're thinking, how can I shoehorn this hit into the story? Uh, she also says, I come from a world where reshoots are constantly are costly and shameful, while Paulus likened making theater to reshooting every day. I find this definitely an interesting kind of thing. Morissette is quoted as saying, God is in the details, and her focus in rehearsals was on the subtleties in the story. Paulus recalled a time when the singer came to rehearsals and gave notes on a scene where Mary Jane is waiting in line at the pharmacy. Morissette felt the actors playing the people waiting in line weren't apathetic enough to the issues Mary Jane was facing. 
She says, Morissette says, the more overt expression is slam dunked and to know that every layer has deep, profound care for it coming from all of us is pretty awesome. I am intrigued. Um, Jagged Little Pill previews November 3rd at the Broadhurst Theater in New York ahead of an official opening on December 5th. This album was a huge part of my life. It's still um, on my playlist today, and I still belt out songs when they come on. So if I have a chance to see this, I'm definitely going to. I find it interesting when musicals are made out of albums like this, and I... I mean, I'm intrigued for the story because, uh, you know, as they do say, it's not just your, your typical, typical kind of jukebox musical where they take an album and kind of try to shove everything (laughs) into it, make try to make it make sense. And that's, that's sometimes more successful than other times, but I am interested to see how this goes. And as a fan, very, very, very intrigued. So I do see that it is time to take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we have a few more stories of news from the music world. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Music Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Music Podcast. We are talking about stories from the world of music. And we are turning now to a story about Missy Elliott, who is um, about to become the first ever female hip-hop artist inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. That is happening on June 13. She's also preparing to drop her first album since 2005. So, wow, it's been 14 years. That's crazy. Um, Elliot spent much of the 90s writing for rising stars, including Aaliyah, Jodici, and SWV, before in 1997 she shifted the timber of R&B hip-hop with her own debut solo album, Supa Dupa Fly, produced by her partner in Beats, Timbaland, and recorded under the moniker Missy Misdemeanor Elliot. She's since released five additional studio albums and has racked up more than 70 singles with her as the primary or featured singer and has penned hits for Ariana Grande, Beyonce, Ciara, and Destiny's Child, among others. Um, Elliot spoke with Billboard about her influences, who's still on her wish list of collaborators, uh, which includes Rihanna, and why writing for herself is so much more difficult than writing for others. Um, so this is part of that interview with Billboard. Um, she says that to be the first female hip hop artist to be inducted in the songwriters hall of fame has made me feel thankful to God first for this gift. Then it makes me look back on my life, thinking of all the sleepless nights, staying up writing, even when I was tired or sick and all the times I got into trouble as a kid for writing songs on my mother's nice white walls in the house, LOL. To know my work has not been in vain and recognized by many makes it all worth it. To be inducted with other phenomenal writers, for that I am humbly grateful. 
And if you want to read more of that article and hear more about her experiences and her experiences, not only with songwriting, but those people that she would still like to work with, who those who she's already collaborated with, um, you can read that on Billboard. She is being inducted, as I said, on June 13, and she is being inducted along with British singer Cat Stevens, country folk icon John Prine, um, Tom T. Hall, who Johnny Cash called his all-time favorite songwriter, Jack Temchin, who wrote songs for the Eagles and Glenn Frey's solo albums, and Dallas Austin, the songwriter behind radio hits for TLC, Monica, Pink, Boys to Men, Madonna, and more. Uh, it turns out that Elliot is the just the third rapper to enter the Songwriters Hall following Jay-Z and Jermaine Dupri's inductions in 2017 and 2018, respectively. And she is the first female hip-hop writer to be inducted. So that is exciting. That will be June 13 at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in New York City. Songwriters are eligible for induction after writing hit songs for at least 20 years. Congratulations to Missy Elliott on this honor. Um, turning now to a, a slightly more obscure story. I kind of like the more obscure stories and stories of people doing things with the gifts that they've been given or the um, the results of their hard work, etc. So this is um, that Australian musicians have banded together to invest in solar farms. And I just find this to be interesting and a, an interesting thing to do with their, with their money, with their time, with whatever fame or power they have due to their careers. Um, in the spring of 2017, according to an article in The Guardian, immediately after the release of the Australian band Cloud Control's third album, Zone, the band's keyboard player, Heidi Lefner was their third album was called Zone, excuse me. And then the band's keyboard player, Heidi Lef Lenfer, was contemplating what their upcoming, upcoming tour would cost. But this time she wasn't just thinking about the money, she was thinking about emissions. Independent bands are used to running on a shoestring budget. A carbon conscience Conscious Lenfer wanted cloud control to run a more environmentally efficient operation, too. So she began asking climate scientists in the field and um, connected with uh, Dr. Chris Day from Arate Sustainability, who crunched the numbers for Cloud Control's two-week tour. They were playing 15 clubs and theaters from Byron Bay to Perth, and he found that it would produce about 28 tons of emissions, roughly equivalent to what an average household produces in a year. And that was just the national leg of an album tour that would take the band to the U.S. three times. Lenfer is quoted as saying, I had suspected that all of this flying and all the energy that goes into tours can't be very good for the environment, but there was no solution that existed beyond carbon offsetting. Um, so Lenfer wanted to aim higher than just carbon offsetting, and she has partnered with the... Hmm, Superannuation Fund, I think I said that right, Future Super, and the developer Impact Investment Group, and established FEET, Future Energy Artists, a platform that officially launches on Wednesday and will allow musicians to build and invest in their own solar farms. Early signs are promising, as well as cloud control. Other Australian bands already signed up include Midnight Oil, Vance Joy, Regurgitator, Big Scary, Peking Duck, and Jack River. The first solar farm being built with their help is Brigalow, an 80-hectare project near Pittsworth on Queensland's Darling Downs. Um, speaking to Guardian Australia... Paul Curtis, Regurgitator's manager, talks about an actively engaged citizenry embracing a more optimistic and progressive approach to the future. Lenfer wanted to tap into the creative drive of her industry to find a solution to a complex problem. Uh, she says, the environmental movement often lacks a positive premise for action. It is exciting to own a piece of a solar farm. To do that collectively, we can leave a lasting, tangible infrastructure legacy and say, we built that together. So you may be wondering how this works. 
uh, money that artists invest into feet is put into a portfolio which is managed by Future Super and can be used to buy ownership stakes in solar farms or loaned to build their infrastructure. The land that Brigalow Solar Farm is being built on was previously used as a sorghum grain farm. It is now being leased from the land's owner to build the solar project, whose progress is closely monitored by Impact Investment Group, which manages the underlying fund investing in Brigalow. Artists can put forward as much as they can afford. So... Uh, Feet says the 34.55 megawatt Brigalow solar farm could power the equivalent of 11,300 homes for 30 years. Or looked at another way, it could generate more than 2,000 cloud control tours in renewable energy. That energy is then sold into the energy market with a target return on investment for artists of 5% a year. Um, this story goes on, but that gives you an idea of what's going on. Artists doing something to uh, not only offset their carbon emissions, but also to address some of the reuse renewable energy issues that we have going on worldwide. Again, I just appreciate when people look at a problem and say, hmm, what can I do about that? What do I have the resources for? Who do I know that wants to be in on this with me, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So I found that to be a really interesting article. And it is now time to wrap up this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the GSMC Music Podcast. Join me again next week when we will be looking at various news from um, artists and albums, tours, etc. All of the news from the world of music. Have a great week. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music. Music from sports to entertainment and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.